If you had your Bibles with you, we'd ask you to turn to the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 8, and we're going to begin reading in verse 17. Mark chapter 8, beginning in verse 17. The Bible says, And when Jesus knew it, He saith unto them, Why reason ye, because ye, ye have no bread? Perceive ye not yet, neither understand? Have ye, have, ye, have, ye your, have ye your heart yet hardened? Having eyes, see ye not? And having ears, hear ye not? And do ye not remember? <coughs> when I break the five woes, among the five, among five thousand, how many baskets full of fragments took ye up? And they said unto him, Twelve. And when the seven among four thousand, how many baskets full of fragments took ye up? And they said, Seven. And he said unto them, How is it that you do not understand? Then he cometh to Bethesda, and they bring a blind man unto him, and besought him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of, the, out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands upon him, he asked him if he saw aught. And he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank You and we praise You for Your goodness and watch care. We thank You and praise You for Your Word, Lord. We pray that it may frame our lives and the things that we do. We pray that it would frame our worship and how You're lifted up, Lord, this morning. Lord God, we pray for the lost this morning that You might touch them, Lord, that You might uh, finger about their heart, Lord, and that they might understand and know that You're King. Lord, that You're on the throne and You're the only means of salvation this morning. We pray that. Lord God, we pray for the redeemed, Lord, that we might see in Your Word new truth. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, this morning I'll be uh, preaching on the thought, what do you see? Uh, when you look about this morning, uh, what do you look upon? What, what, what is the ideas that you perceive from what's going on around you? Now, if you don't, uh, if you see well physically, you really don't understand what it is not to see well physically. Uh, I cannot see well at all without my glasses, and, and don't even really try. Uh, most people don't know this, and I, I guess he doesn't care me saying this. Jared is blind in one eye, and uh, that hinders his vision. He's not able to see well as, as other people. And you know, what I found in a spiritual sense is the more you're in the world, the more poor your spiritual vision becomes. The more you're out there, the less, thing, the less that you see in eternal sense. And you begin to see and perceive things like everybody else about you. Uh, back in our text, I want you to see the Bible says, And when Jesus knew it, now, what he knew was that they, uh, he had told them to buy some bread for the disciples and to give them to, that they'd have something to eat, and they forgot to purchase the bread. And when they got back, um, they, he was a little upset with them, not about the bread. What he was upset about with them was how they uh, treated the Samaritan woman. That's what he was upset about. And you know what? Uh, uh, a lot of times I think he would be upset with us the way that we treat other people. Uh, how self-righteous that we get. And uh, that's exactly what he was upset about. And, and so when they, he, he knew what was going on, you know, the most disturbing thoughts that you will ever have about Christ is that he knows your thoughts. And, and that is the reality. He certainly does. See, he can't be fully God and fully man and not, and not already know what we think before we think it. And, and that is God. So when we, have, when we have ungodly thoughts, he's reading us just like a book. Uh, when, we have, when we have thoughts that are distanced from Christ, he knows that. And, and so he knew what they were thinking and they're all upset about this bread. And you know what? We as the Lord's people today, we get up more upset about missing a meal than we do missing church. And that's what he was getting at. We, we get more upset. You know, uh, I, I really haven't looked around that much downstairs yet today, but I know we're going to have plenty to eat. And it may not 
me what you want. Now, uh, everybody has their own taste, and uh, I don't really like spaghetti. I will eat it, and my wife has said it before me many, many times, and I eat it. I'm not going to fuss about something when I, something's always better than nothing, right? Uh, on the other hand, Matthew, at least he used to love spaghetti, and we had it at least once a week because Matthew liked it. And you know what? It was something to eat, and I want to praise the Lord for it. And after all this time, and we were at mid-ministry, or maybe late mid-ministry, one and a half to two years, they still did not get it. And you know what? I've known people that supposedly been serving the Lord a lifetime and still not get it. Yeah. And, and, and still worried about where the next meal is coming from. And, and so he knew what they were saying. And, and when Jesus knew it, he saith unto them, Why reason ye, because ye have bought no bread? Perceive ye not yet, neither understand. Have your heart yet have you have ye your heart yet hardened? Now, uh, the reason that's so hard to uh, read, have ye yet hardened your heart, is because he said, what he's asking, have you hardened your heart again? Uh, have you got it one day and missed it the next day? And you know what? I have to say a resounding yes for myself. Many times I've hardened my heart and forgotten what a great God we serve. Many times when the bills come due, we begin to fret and worry, and we forget about the God that we serve. And you know what? You know what? I, I just come to see this. You know what? If, if your current is to be cut off, if we believe God is sovereign, and He is, if the light company comes and shuts it off because you don't have the money to pay the bill, or if your neighbor hits the light pole and knocks it down, either way you lose your current, don't you? Because God is sovereign. And, and so we see then that uh, they did not get this. They were still stressed out. Being in and among the Lord Jesus Christ Himself, they still didn't go, get it. Having, having eyes, see you not. Now listen, uh, uh, everybody wants to reduce in the modern day Belief in Christ to simple faith. And I see what they're saying. I'm not reducing your faith in Christ. Don't, don't get me wrong. But you know what? I've seen some things too. Um, Adam, I've seen him healed. I mean, the first year of his life, he was, he was sick more than he's well, and I'm not making that up. That, 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 that's why, you know, I've, se I've seen that. I've seen it in myself. Uh, but you know what? I guarantee you, knowing that of myself, if one of these grandbabies came up sick today, I'd begin to wonder. Right? That is the nature of flesh. It's very easy to be critical of the apostles, but yet and still, we're the very same way. And so that's what he said. Have you any faith? Have you not seen anything? Do you not understand what is occurring here? Don't you see it? Having eyes, see you not. And having ears, hear you not. And do you not remember? When I break, five, when I break the five loaves among five thousand, how many baskets uh, full of fragments took you up? And they said twelve. Now, now, do you get the provision in that? It's because there was one for each of them. They had one apiece. After feeding 5,000 men, besides women and children, with five loaves and two fish, after all that was done, they took up provision enough for each man apiece. Now, everybody wants to say, well, they took up 12 big baskets full. I don't necessarily believe that. It really doesn't say how big the baskets were. Did you ever think about that? I think it was about like a lunchbox. One day's provision. How, how, how many? How many times? How much manna did come down? How many times were they supposed to gather the manna? One time a day and gather enough for two days on the day before the Sabbath, right? That's what they were to do. And if they violated it, all that ruin, everything extra that 
they took in was, was devoured by, by rot and by, and by bugs and stuff like that. And, and, and so when we think about this, and, and you think about that, don't get in your mind necessarily that they were huge bushel baskets of extra stuff. Probably it was one day's provision. But you know what? One day's provision was enough. And we just don't get that in modern day, do we? We just don't get it. And, and so he asked them that. Then the next thing, he said, when I, uh, when I fed 4,000 and took up, he, he, he said, how many, how many baskets did I take up then? And he said, seven. Now, that promotes a little bit of a problem, does it not? How many apostles were there? Twelve, right? You know what that means? If there were seven, somebody had to share. Did you get that? Somebody had to divide their basket with somebody else. And you think if there were seven, surely, of course you don't know of the selfishness of, of, of people then and the people now, surely they give one of those seven baskets to the Lord Jesus Christ and that left six for the apostles and that means they had to divide. You know what? Sometimes you're going to have to divide what you have with others. And you know what? In order to throw your apostles, they are going to do it. It, 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 you know what? You don't do it begrudgingly. You know what? If you do it begrudgingly, you might as well just keep it yourself. Right. And, and so, we as the Lord's people, then, then we, we need to understand that the provision of God always comes, but it doesn't always come on our terms. You, you know what? What you know? What we when we pray, you know, and you see these little youngins hungry or something, and you pray for provision. And all you got is rice, you'd be upset. I mean, really, we would, would we not? Rice, you know, uh, this sounds crazy. You know, rice, I love rice, you know, and I eat it just about any way you can fix it. But when I was a kid, and some of you older people will remember this with me, it was a breakfast food. You didn't have rice all day. You, if you had rice, you fixed it with butter and sugar and just like oats but it was white and that's how you ate rice and, and I didn't know you could fry it and put it with meat or any of that type was much older and so if you prayed and you thought and all you got was rice now this is what I remember about rice when I was a kid that if you didn't put enough sugar in it it was just bland you couldn't hardly get it down and we want the good stuff don't we we are not satisfied with the provision of God. If it was rice, we would want more. If it was rice, we would want potatoes. If it was potatoes, we'd want steak. And if you don't believe that, follow, follow, the, follow the, the, the story of the children of Israel. And they, they got what they needed, but they wanted quail. In fact, they said this, and our soul, it became a spiritual issue, our soul loatheth this light bread. You know what? You know what they were saying? God, we hate your provision. Our, our, we hate what you have to offer. And you know what? That's why grace is hated today, is because it's so simple and, and so easy. Your salvation is in the hand of the mighty God. End of story. Now, I mean, we loathe that, don't we? Loathe the plain, right? And, and so then we as the Lord's people, certainly we ought to understand and know what, uh, what our needs are. But we don't. And He said unto them, How is it that you do not understand? My shoe's untied. I killed myself. Alright. And he said unto them, How is it that you, you, you do not understand? And he cometh to Bethesda. And you need to answer that question. How is it that you do not understand? Well, the way that we don't understand is this, is we spend too much time out there. And we get real worldly. And we begin to think about, the way, uh, think about things the way the world thinks about things. And he said unto them, How is it that you do not understand? And he cometh to Bethesda, and they bring a blind man unto him, and besought him to touch him. Now, I don't know how much time you've ever spent around blind people, 
but blind people will teach you things. I remember, now the first thing is with blind people, nine times out of ten, you do not know they're blind until they tell you. Especially if you meet them sitting down. Now, the last experience I had with a, with a blind person, I had my students at one of the nursing homes in Clarksville, and we were passing trays, and I took the tray in, and I set it down, and I said, Mr. Smith, here is your food. And he said, well, what is it? And then I knew he was blind. And all of you that have done any nursing knows what the cloth method is, right? And so immediately, I jumped in and I said, your beans is at 4 o'clock, your roll is at 8 o'clock, and your meat's on top. And he smiled at me, and, and he began to feel around for his silverware. You see, a lot of times you don't know you're blind spiritually. Did you know that redeemed people can look at a thing in a blind way? And, and we do a whole lot of the times. We, we, if you don't, you know, uh, if you don't believe that, read the story of Elisha and his servant and uh, Gehazi probably is who it was. And he said, "Open his eyes that he may see." And he saw the hills and the hollows full of God's angels. See, we need to be able to see that way in the modern day. So this blind man comes up. And they say he needs to be he needs to be made to see. And he, meaning Christ, took the blind man by the hand and led him out of town. Now another thing you will learn about blind people is that they're very cautious of strangers. And listen, if you couldn't see them, you'd be cautious of strangers too. I'm cautious of strangers when I can see them, much less if I can never even look at the eyes I was looking into. Now, you know what it took for that blind man to leave with Christ a man that he never even heard speak, much less see? It took trust. See, his buddies that he brought him to Christ stayed behind. And it said that Christ took... You, you know what? To see things in a spiritual sense, you're just going to have to trust Him. You just don't have to trust Him and say, you know what? He knows far better than me. I'm just going to trust who Christ is. If I believe He's God in the flesh, He's going to lead me in the right direction. And listen, when you trust Him, don't expect steak and potatoes at the end of the road. You know what? When you get there, you may not have nothing but rice with no sugar, but you still trust Christ. See, you know, that's another thing that in the modern age that's about to reduce Christ to nothing is this, is this health and wealthiness. You know what? Uh, just because you trust Christ doesn't mean that you're going to have a darn charger sitting in your driveway. Right? You may have the Pinto. And you know what? You may not even have that. And, and, and so then we as the Lord's people, we need to begin to understand and know that despite what we think, we must trust Christ. And when we trust Christ, we'll see things in a much better way. Verse 24. Uh, uh, verse 23. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the, out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands upon him... And when he, uh, he, he asked him if he saw aught. Now, can you get this in your mind? Because read the Word of God for what it says. It says that when he spit on his eyes. You know what is still one of the greatest insults? Is to spit on somebody else. And you know what? That's almost cross-culturally. You can go anywhere. And spitting on someone else is, is pretty much an insult. Much less spitting in their face. But it said that Jesus spit in his eyes. You know what that says? Whatever Christ gives, you take it. Because you don't want the end result to be good. It may not be pleasant in the beginning. It may not be something that you, you, you just ravish and, and glad about. But you continue to trust Christ. And so he spit. And then it says that he rubbed his eyes. 
and says, how do you see? Now, the next part is essential, and Sovereign Grace Baptists don't like this, but you know what? You just have to be honest. And if something don't work out, we want to blame God's sovereignty, don't we? But he was honest, and he says, how do you see? He says, I see men as trees walking. You know what? That's not good vision. It's a lot better than he had, but you know what? I'd say nine-tenths of the time when I, when I take off my glasses and I, I, I'm like this, I can see to about, uh, uh, to recognize maybe to where Brother Junior is at. And, and on this side, I recognize my wife and I did, if I didn't know Tassel was sitting there, I wouldn't be able to recognize her. And, and you know what? Uh, I'm not satisfied with that. Are you? That's why I put these on. First thing I reach for in the morning and the last thing I put off at night is these glasses because they're my eyes and I want to see clearly. You know, why can't we want that for spiritual things? So he said, you know what? <laughs> I can't see good. And you know what? Among the redeemed, and I'm not talking about the lost. According to the Word of God, the lost are blind. Right? But I'm talking about among the redeemed. I see him satisfied with that a whole, whole lot. Just a, dis a distant, blurry vision. And not to see the will of God in a crystal clear manner. You know what? That's what I want. Jared, with this opportunity, you see God's vision in a clear, crystal clear manner and then you go with it. Don't be satisfied with a maybe so. And you know, oh, that looks like a man or it might be a tree. Don't, don't be satisfied with that. You and every one of you look for clear vision when it comes to spiritual things. And don't be satisfied with anything less. And, and, and so he says, he's honest, he says, it's not there yet. I don't see clear yet. It's not, it's not as clear as it should be. Notice what he says. And after he put his hands again upon his eyes and made him look up, he was restored and saw every man clearly. Now, I want you to see that second event had to happen. Uh, if he wanted to see clear. And you know what? There's a lesson in that because do you not think that Christ could have done it the first time around if that's what he chose, chose to do? There's a lesson there. In fact, you know, if he uh, if he wanted to, he could have just spoken to me back up in town with all those other people watching. That's why in the temple he says, Rise, be thou healed. He said the man got up and went to jumping and running. So it wasn't because of inability. It was to show that vision is precious. And getting a clear vision of a situation takes time. And don't jump to conclusions. You know, what I found among this flesh is this. Don't watch your first opinion. Uh, watch, watch your first ideas because a lot of times they're wrong. Go me to the book of Psalms, Psalms 140. Psalms 140. And we'll begin reading in the very first verse. Psalms 140, in the very first verse, a psalm written by David. He says, Deliver me, O Lord, from the evil man. Now, I want you to see that he's not talking about national Israel, and he's not talking about uh, in a specific battle, but he says very individualistic to one individual, deliver me, O Lord, from the evil man. Now, I don't know if this evil man was a violent man or a man that just come up to him face to face and was aggressive. I, I doubt that in a way because, listen, David was king. You know who the evil man probably was? Himself. Mm. The very one that led with Bathsheba when she was a married woman. You know who my evil man is right here? You're looking at me. That's my biggest problem. And when you look in the mirror, when you get back to the house, that's your biggest problem too. Deliver me from the evil man. 
You, you know, uh, as long as this flesh is in control, you're never going to see clearly. As long as you let this flesh be the driving force and you don't look at things in spiritual eye, you're not, I mean, you're, you're just not in control. You need to be delivered. And so he says, deliver me from the evil man, from the, uh, preserve me from the violent man, which imagine mischiefs in their heart continually, continually they gather together for war, which imagine mischiefs in their heart. You know what? The worst thing you can have is a bunch of time on your hands. Because all you do is think about things that it, it should... You, you know, uh, uh, the Quakers and the Shakers believe that firmly. And that's why they kept busy all the time. They, did, they didn't leave any time for the flesh. And they were constantly doing something. You know what? That, that's not a bad idea. Because this, this mind is not good to be left alone. It, you know what? If you have a lot of extra time, the best thing you can do is to get in that mother book and try to understand a little bit more about it and, and, and sop up your extra time that way. Because listen, this flesh, it just simply cannot be trusted in any way whatsoever. And so David, uh, David uh, uh, makes mention of that. And they have sharpened their tongues like a serpent. Adder's poison is under their lips, Selah. Keep me, O Lord, from the hands of the wicked. Preserve me from the violent man who have purposed to overthrow my, my goings. Now, in verse 5 he says, The proud have hid a snare for me, and cords have spread a net by the wayside. They have set gins for me. Selah. Now, one of the first things you need to be able to see is your enemy. Number one, it's you. It's yourself. Number two, there are enemies out there. There are people out there, even in your closest family, that would like nothing better to see you fall flat on your face. They're there. You know, uh, and I'm not talking about financially. See, financially sometimes they'll encourage you so that you'll fall flat on your face spiritually. So that they that 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 you will be weak and beggarly in, in a spiritual sense. So David said, you know what? Deliver me from that. Let me understand my enemies. Let me see who the problem is. So this morning, one of the clearest visions you need to have is, is every individual in your life, how are they impacting you? You know what? Sometimes some of my closest family, I just had to say, you know what? The best, you know, uh, the best thing I can do is my grandmother used to say is pass and repass. That means just kind of wave and keep going. And if they're not impacting you in a positive spiritual way, that's how they need to be dealt with. You don't have to be ugly. You don't have to be mean. But you, listen, you don't need that negativity, spiritualness in your life because what it's going to do is cloud your vision. Now, if I had a, if I, if I had a health problem this morning, say that I had lung cancer, why would I go to a garage, just say, Larry Fitzhughes, and say, hey, can you test me and let me know what needs to be done for this lung cancer? No, I would go to somebody that was a cancer doctor and I would get their advice there. So why would we take spiritual advice from a lost person? Why would we take spiritual advice for somebody that don't even believe like we do? You see what I'm saying? And I'll tell you why. We don't want the hard facts. You know, everybody, everybody has those kind of friends that they always tell you what you want to hear. Let me say first of all, they're not real friends. Remember when uh, Israel was going out to battle and the leader said, well, I need to speak to a prophet. And the prophet said, go for it. 
All is well. God's going to give you the victory. So he said, you know what? I don't really need to talk to another prophet. And so he talked to another prophet. The prophet said, go for it. All is well. You will take him down. Then he still wasn't satisfied. He said, I really need. Is there another prophet? And he said, yeah, there's one, but I hate him. Yeah. And the real prophet, which was Elijah, said, you can do it, but you're going down. See, we don't like the truth, do we? Unless we can see clearly. You know what? When, when the truth comes to you, if you don't like it, it's because you're not seeing clearly. The Word of God is never wrong. The Word of God is always right. So if you can't accept it and embrace it and cherish it, you're just not seeing right. You're, you're, you're just not looking at it. You see, you see as men walk, as trees walking, you don't have the clarity you need. So the first thing you need to see really, really, really clear is your enemy and who your enemy is. Go with me to Isaiah uh, chapter uh, number 6. Very familiar verses of Scripture. I want, I want to read this in your hearing this morning. Isaiah chapter 6, in the very first verse, uh, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and His train fell, filled the temple. You know what a wonderful thing that is. You, you, you know what you need this morning? You need to see the Lord Jesus Christ high and lifted up. You need to see God the Father, the great God Jehovah, high and lifted up this morning. You know what? The, the Russellites, they call themselves Jehovah's Witnesses, and they are not. They're most certainly not Jehovah's Witnesses. They're the witness of Bims above the devil. But his name is Jehovah. Jehovah Jireh. Uh, why can't we rejoice in that? I, I want to see Jehovah, Jehovah God, high and lifted up above the throne. Do you not? I want to see Jesus. And you know what? Uh, 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 you know, and the older I get, the more I want to see the Holy Ghost. I want to see Him worked out. And I want to see Him doing things like I've never beheld. Because you know what? He is part of God and He is not to be minimized in the right. least little right. way. See, when we see that... You, you know what the problem is this morning? Why you can't see Him like you should? It's this world. You know, separation's real purpose is not so that you will look like a freak when you're out in the streets. Ladies, it's not so that everybody immediately assume you're Pentecostal. That, that's not the purpose of separation. The purpose of separation is this so that we can see Christ high and lifted up. That, that's the purpose because see, the more ingrained in this world you get, the more blind to spiritual things you become. The more wrapped up you get in your career, the more blind spiritually you become. And he, you know what? That's what Christ said in His own ministry. Unless you hate father and mother and children, listen, unless you hate them all above me, You'll never see me for who I am. That's what he was saying. That's sometimes why you have to put the familiar relationships aside. There was there, there was a time I didn't, I, you know, I just didn't have that much interaction with my family. And it wasn't because I didn't love them. It wasn't because I didn't like them. I just didn't need it. See what I'm saying? I began to see things in the spiritual sense. And you need you know what your need is this morning? To see to see God in strong, high, and lifted up. Read the first five chapters of Isaiah. And then you read the sixth chapter. And then you read the rest of it. And he went from being mad at Israel to feeling sorry for it. Now his ministry didn't change. You know what his whole that whole book is, I can sum it, sum it up in very few words. Judgment's coming. Mm -hmm. That's what the whole book's about. <laughs> but it went from judgment's coming <laughs> and you deserve it. To judgment's coming and please repent. This is a serious matter. 
judgment's coming. You see what I'm saying? That, that there's a huge difference in that, is it not? Judgment's coming. See, when you see the Lord high and lifted up, when you see Him above everything else, things begin to ch uh, change. And, 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 and so we find then that the second thing that you need to see this morning is the Lord Jesus Christ high and lifted up. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. You look on close. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I'm going to begin reading in verse 22. 1 Corinthians 1, mm, chap, uh, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 22. For the Jews require a sign. Now, everybody's wanting a sign, right? You know, even the Lord Jesus in His own ministry says, <laughs> you can discern the face of the sky because they say when... When the sun is red and lowering, it's going to rain the next day. And, and, and they wanted some kind of sign. They even wanted a sign that Christ was who He said He was. You know, really today, that's the main reason the Jews don't recognize Christ who he, for who He was is because they said He don't fit the signs. See, uh, you don't need any signs like that. Wait on the sign to do something. You know what? You simply need to seek the face of God and when you get His will, do it. You don't need to see the sky turning back so many degrees. You know, Moses wanted that. We don't have to see stuff like that. Now, uh, first of all, don't you put a timetable and don't you put... You know what? How stupid is, a, is it for us to put requirements on God? That's about as stupid as you can get, but every one of us has done it. Right? And, and, and so then we as the Lord's people, uh, we find that as Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, he, he hits the nail on the head and says, uh, huh, for the Jews require a sign, the Greeks seek after wisdom, or what they call wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, and to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. You know what you need to see? If you've never been saved this morning, you simply need to see this, Christ and Him crucified. Good Baptist doctrine is fine. But what? The, the singular thing is Jesus and Him crucified. Did the thief on the cross have baptism? Was he a member of the church? At least the way most Baptists look at it is impossible, right? He was baptized, right? So, what, what, what was the priority then? It was just seeing Christ and Him crucified. He went, because you, you, you read the Gospel of Mark, and the Gospel of Mark, I think, is the one that says that they both riled on Him. Saying, you're not who you say you are. If you really be Christ, save us and you. But before the end of the day, before that six hour period was over with, before that was done, he said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. See, he saw Christ and him crucified. You know, you know it, it, it ought to make your salvation precious to you. To know that people literally sitting under the gospel for the entirety of their life and never their heart be opened. Man, does that not make your salvation sweet and good and, and the very best thing you have? Because listen, you know, the only thing difference between you and them is the goodness of God. That's the only, that's the only difference. And, and, and so we, we find then that a thing that we need to see, the thing, a thing that you lost person, you need to see this morning, what you need to see is Jesus Christ. Preach Jesus Christ crucified and the Jews stumbling back into the Greek foolishness, but unto them that are called, to them which are called. 
You know what? We know why the Holy Ghost is so precious. That's where the calling comes from. It doesn't come from me preaching. It doesn't come from uh, some kind of thing you have at the end of the service. But listen, it comes from the person of the Holy Ghost calling men unto Himself. That's the difference. You know, that's the thing about Armenian doctrine that people leave out is the drawing of the Holy Ghost is the doctrine. See, the gospel is not logic. You know what? If the building was on fire this morning, I'd decide to leave, right? I, I'm not the sharpest knife in the door, but I ain't going to just stick around while the building burning up. <clears throat> but that has no spiritual value whatsoever. That, that's logic. You know what? The building's on fire. Hey, I'm leaving. But that has no spiritual value. None whatsoever. And so then we, we find then that, that, that salvation then is completely of the Lord. And, and, and listen, this morning, if you've not been saved, you need to look at Jesus. You need to consider the fullness of the cross. Because, uh, but, but unto them that are called, both the Jews and the Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Because the, foolish of God, the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Now, I want you to see uh, the weakness of God. You know, uh, you know why grace is so hated? Because it's so simple. You know why being baptized sounds so much better to the flesh is because it's something you can do. You know why saying the sinner's prayer sounds better than just wait the Lord? Because it sounds good to the flesh, does it not? And just say that little mini prayer and everything's going to be alright. No, you can't. Because there's no room in that little prayer for the Holy Spirit. To speak God to you. See, had you really been saved? Has He really spoken life to you? Because really that's all that matters. At the, end, at the end of your life, if you live to be 80, 90, or 100 years old, it doesn't matter what Baptist doctrine that appeals to you. What matters is has Christ spoken life to you? That's all that matters. Right? Really, I mean, the, the, does anything else really matter? And I would have to say, no, when you look at the reality of going to be with your Lord. Verse 26. For ye see your calling, brethren, for ye see your calling. Do you see your calling this morning? I see mine. I still rejoice in it today, and it's been more than 30 years ago, and closer to 40. And I see my calling every time I make the corner to go to Mother's at Carlisle, look at that little Fremont building, and I say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. They may not know much, but they preached the preach Christ and Him crucified. Love that little spot. What about you? Walking up Melton Springs Hall. I, when I go up through there, I think of you. You see what I'm saying? We, has He called you? At the end of the day, does anything else really matter? And I, I don't mean a, a smooth tongued preacher. I mean, has Christ called you? Has the Holy Ghost called you unto Himself? See, when, when Christ called out Lazarus, it was very specific, wasn't it? Lazarus, come forth. Two things he didn't say. He didn't say, come forth! Because see, if he just said a general call, every grave in, in the whole world would have popped open and everybody would come out. It was specific to Lazarus, right? Right. And, and, and the other thing is this. <laughs> he didn't say, Lazarus, come forth if you want to. Did he? Lazarus, come forth. 
See, if you don't have something to compare to that, you're probably still lost. Because that, that, that's what salvation is. It's a calling. It has nothing to do whatsoever with what you think or what you decide or what you want to do. Have you been called? That's why Peter said, listen, make your calling and election sure because that is what is necessary is a spiritual calling that comes in from Christ. For see your calling, brethren, that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God had chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Now, you know, you know, church, what He's calling us there? He's calling us foolish. And you know what? I just have to say amen to that. I, I, I know I'm a spiritual dum-dum. But He chose me. You know, that, that's all that matters, is not He chose me and He called me. Well, well, what more could I want? So this morning I ask you, has He spoke to you? Will you ever see the Lord Jesus Christ high and lifted up? Have you seen His train, that train being His presence? Have you, you know, have you ever seen it fill the temple? This little building we got right here, wouldn't it be a wonderful thing this morning if His presence came down the train and filled the temple? That, that's what, you tell me, you know what, you know why God's people are so discouraged today? It's because People can say what they want to and, and, and I act the way they want to, but His presence just ain't filling the temple. What about you? I spoke about revival Wednesday night. I told you it starts with you. If you get revived, it will spread. And if you remain dormant in, uh, in health care, we we'll use the name dormant a whole lot. Because, you know, you can have a dormant pneumonia. And it's there, but we just got to kind of knock down. And you know what? I think there's a lot of saved people who may have the presence of the Holy Ghost, but it's not down, it's dormant. And what we need to do is get alive. To be the very first thing in our life. And that don't happen easily. That don't happen just because you say so. So where are you at this morning? What is your need?